Tonight on Join News Prime, NDC youth successfully pull off March for Justice demonstration to, among others, protest brutalities meted out by, the security, by security personnel. <laughs> The Sanchi Regional Minister has meanwhile justified the deployment of the military to curl the Ejura protests when he appeared before the Ministerial Committee probing the violence which claimed two lives. I requested Lieutenant Colonel Pepra to again send some personnel to go and support the police. Also appearing before the committee was Love News' Erastus Asaradonko, who gave a first-hand account of events that day. Some of his videos, he took some of the videos while standing close to uncompleted projects, um, bad roads, and then he will make, uh, he will add a narration to the video and then post it on social media. Ghana National Fire Service says its men did a good job in containing Monday's fire in the central business district despite the many challenges confronting its operations. It's not true that the government is not caring for the fire service. That is unheard of. It's not correct. The government has supported the fire service more than ever. In business, prices of petroleum products to shoot up sharply in the coming weeks after cartel of all producing countries, OPEC, fails to reach agreement on increasing supplies. And then 14-year-old boy gets his feet chopped off in a chainsaw accident. My name is Israel Lai. Joining us Prime is coming to you live from our final fast studios at Kukumilimli here in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to wear and also on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV Channel 144. This is the home of independent, fearless, credible and impactful journalism. Stay tuned in. Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osei has justified the recent deployment of the military to Ijirat to kill riots there, explaining it was based on intelligence received by the Regional Security Council. According to the minister, there was information about threats by the youth of the town to burn state and private property after the burial of social activist Mohammed Ibrahim also known as Kaka, appearing before the Ministerial Committee tasked to investigate circumstances leading to the killing of two persons during the protest, the minister said the law establishing the Security Council grants him the power to deploy the military. The committee, chaired by an appeals court judge, Justice George Kinsley Kumsing, will receive evidence from witnesses to ascertain the cause of the violence and make recommendations to the president. The minister, Mensah, who was the first witness, told the committee the military contingent was to maintain law and order. I heard the intelligence on 29th June 2021. I requested Lieutenant Colonel Pepra to again send some personnel to go and support the police. I took this decision in line with the security and intelligence agencies act, act 1030. Later in the day, while I was in the meeting, of the regional ministry. At A.H. Hotel in East Ligon, Accra, I received unfortunate news that there had been shooting during the maintenance of peace in the draft. And two lives have been locked.
Shots fired by the security agencies, especially the military on the day, are blamed for the death of two of the protesters and the injury of others. Mr. Ose Mensa, however, explains the security personnel were forced to fire after they were pelted with stones and other missiles. He's, however, unable to tell who fired the shots. On the same day in the evening, that is on the first, and I, I received some video showing some of the footprints of whatever happened. Some of them indicating that, that from the, the video, some you were chasing the police water cannon vehicle, which to disperse the crowd. Honorable, do you have the said video clips that you are talking yes, about? Yes, please, I can. I have it on WhatsApp. I can WhatsApp them to the committee. The Shanti Regional Minister also gave the Commission details of visits he paid to families of the bereaved and injured. We called on the family of the two who died during the incident and Kaka who also clubbed and died. All the three families. We visited them. During the visit the Minister of Interior gave some money for the initial expenses, even though we had been informed by a Ejrahine that he had also paid for some of the initial expenses. While the amount, 7,000 to each of the families, so 7,000. From there, we visited the three families of the Indians. Unfortunately, we met only one. The, the remaining two were still at the hospital. The one we met, uh, if I remember the name very well, is called Nu 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 were so at the hospital. And as I speak, one hour is so at Confuanochi teaching hospital. The other injured was sent to Duayang in Kwanta hospital. Actually, I've not been there. Also appearing before the Ministry of Probe Tuesday was Love News' Erastus Asaradonko, who together with his crew covered events during the protest live. Indeed, one of the two persons killed in Nigeria was a young man who was giving protection to Erastus and his crew. Erastus recounted the events of that day. And the firing was into the air? Yes, my lord. The firing, my lord, went on for about a minute into the air. And then the firing seemed to be coming down, being lowered. Please, can you, can you explain that, or can you demonstrate that? It's into the air, then which angle again? So initially, we saw them, when they stepped out of the vehicle, they started shooting at this range. 
Then it came something like this. About the angle of the fire. Yes, the I angle. thought you were talking about the intensity. You see, uh, the shots were into the air, and you said uh, it started coming down. So I thought uh, you were referring to the intensity of the firing. But my lord, I'm referring to the angle at which they were. Very well, thank you. Well, joining us uh, now is security analyst Adam Bona, who's been uh, observing proceedings today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bona, uh, for making time to speak with us. Uh, so you've been watching the proceedings, today's proceedings. What do you make of it, or what, what was running through your mind? Well, thank you very much, uh, Israel. Uh, what is running through my mind has to do with the fact that the, uh, the committee could have done a better job today. Uh, Day one, I had, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of expectations of the, of of the committee, especially when I have, uh, I, I believe that those of us who uh, advocate for good security and safety in this country would be proud to have none other person than one of our colleagues, uh, you know, Professor Vladimir Chidanso on the committee, and so to have the committee actually not ask and probably, you know, the regional minister some questions that pertains to his own ill timing and his own, uh, you know, sanctioning of ex something that looks like extrajudicial killings and taking unilateral decisions in sending the military there without informing uh, or call it uh, involving the Ashanti regional police commander. We know that the police is, you know, by, by the law, are supposed to be in the forefront of internal security. And so you cannot disregard the police and bring the military who are not trained to deal with rioters, to shoot and kill people because police stations uh, to you, someone sent you, called you on your private phone and, and informed you. So you decided to take uh, a unilateral decision to send uh, officers in and something that looked almost like uh, pinning uh, the uh, as, uh, as uh, what's the name the Ashanti regional correspondent for multimedia Erastus I think that is his name All right we'll, we'll, come, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to Erastus in a bit but let's just look at uh, the Ashanti regional minister and what he had to say well he observed the situation or he assessed the situation and he thought that it was uh, right to bring in the military how? What assessment went into it? Well, what we, we're not, pre, we're what, not privy what was to a level. We're not privy to whatever exactly. assessment what was or it? whatever information he had, but clearly he assessed the situation and he felt that the military had to come in. I mean, at what point does the military come in? Some of us have been advocating for years that the military should be allowed to perform, you know, protecting the territorial integrity you know, of this country, instead of bringing them into civilian populated areas. And any time they come, these are some of the, the things we see. And so uh, for, for me, I mean, he didn't, you are a minister of state. So to say uh, you are a minister in the Ashanti region, a minister of state, right? And you, according to him, he spoke to the, 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 is it the Northern Command for the military and, and you know, authorize him to send his, his men in. I mean, I, I would have thought that uh, it, if he said he was in Accra, the defense minister is in Accra. He could have spoken to the defense minister. They rallied themselves around. How long would it take to discuss these things and assess the level of, uh, you know, risks and say that let's send them in? You saw the number of police officers who were there. And Israel, let me ask you, where these people were shot? I have not, I, I mean, I know Ezra, but I wasn't there. But I, they should have asked the regional minister where these people were, were shot. Was it anywhere closer to a police station? Where these people, I don't know, but I, I have a suspicion where these people were killed. I stand to be corrected. Correct me if I'm wrong. Where they were killed? Were they killed closer to a police station? If they were killed far away from a police station, then I would say that, you know what? What this man has done, the regional minister, I mean, he's not fit. He doesn't have the emotional intelligence to, you know, uh, superintend over a big region such as Ashanti region. And remember, Asawasi 7, it was under his reign that seven abled men were shot at and paraded as criminals 
and the, a committee report exonerated them. And so mine is that for such a person to be given the mandate again to superintend over the Ashanti region and for the committee to let go of him, with asking him, he, they were almost on their knees begging him to give them names of those who gave him the intel. I mean, they were almost begging him. And I thought that, come on, this is, uh, you know, someone the taxpayer pays, and we are paying you to, to interrogate him. Come on, ask him questions. Let him know that these are the sanctions you get if you don't give us. I mean, even when they said we can do that in camera, he said, unfortunately, I'm not going to give you any information. I mean, and two people are dead. So, I mean, uh, Israel uh, and viewers, I mean, you guys should correct me, but where these people were killed, was there any, and you remember Erastus in uh, the, you know, inquiry today did say that they, one of the persons who died actually took the bullet for him. I mean, so my recommendation, if you ask me, if it is not too early, would be persons like Erastus should be one of the people who should receive counseling and be compensated adequately because he would have been buried along with these two people who died if this guy didn't shoot him. So Israel, for me, we don't have to mince words because you don't know when these things would happen to anyone. So we've got to be, we've got to speak truth to power, Israel. Very much, uh, Adam Bona. He's a, a security uh, analyst uh, bringing us his insights on uh, day one of the Session. You're watching Joy News Prime and now scores of traders at Mokola are still counting their losses after a three-story building housing their wares caught fire on Monday. Shop owners Tuesday morning were giving access to salvage what they could from the building, but the fire reignited from the smoldering rubble. Minister of Trade and Industry Alan Chermanting, who visited the scene, announced that a relief package was being worked out for the victims. Manuel Kranting has more. Contained in one building since morning, it, we have not been able to douse the fire because of the inflammable materials, the cosmetics. The Mayor of Accra, Mohammed so Ni Ajay Soa, describing the situation at Makola Market to Trades Minister Alan Kujutramanting as he visited the scene so of the, the fire on Tuesday. The fire, which was still raging 24 hours after it started, had been reignited from the smoldering rubble demanding immediate attention to tame it again. This is the entry point to the room where the fire is reignited. Or well, this particular room, we're told, houses um, combustible materials, including toiletries, including um, fabrics, and so on and so forth. Well, we've seen spontaneous explosions from this particular room. We have a high fire load in there, and that's the combustible. There are a lot of combustible. All the shops here are used as warehouses and they are fully packed and it's very narrow. So access, getting access even in there was very difficult. We had to even have to break all these shops. We saw, we saw you give access to some of the market women to pick their goods from there. These are the shops that are not been touched yet, the ground floor and the first floor. But even since we started firefighting again, we stopped them. For the affected traders, all they could do was to look on as their wares worth millions of Ghana cities continue to be ravaged by the fire. the <laughs> and I drove for the weaving on the my way come, I have to pack my car and pick motorbike to get here early so that maybe at least if we can be able to retrieve something. But before I got here, everything got bent. I saw beads, crystal beads and any kind of bead. Yeah. How much? How much did you have in there? 
<laughs> I can't tell now because I have two shops there. My warehouse and then the shop. Both of them are bent? Uh, both of them are bent. Yeah, I just want to see my shop, to be sure. Even though I was looking me from the back, I saw it's bent, but I want to really see. I was having this hope, sir, maybe, but I want to just see it if it is real. But, uh, you know, the smoke <laughs> could he allow me to. As a cushion to the victims, the Trades Minister announced that government is developing a relief package to help the victims get back on a path of recovery. I'm here also to sympathize with the victims and to assure them that government is committed and fully behind them. And we are going to take all the necessary steps to ensure that we support them to get them back into their trade. And so I've instructed the Ghana Enterprises Agency to very quickly develop a package of support for the victims um, of this uh, fire incident. Once we are able to identify the cause of uh, this fire incident, we will have to, as a country to reflect very soberly on our domestic retail market infrastructure. 24 hours of fire here at the Makola market. Frantic efforts from personnel from the Ghana National Fire Service have eaten into a day. What we've seen in the past one hour is a re-emergence of the fire from what's been described as a warehouse. A long, narrow room containing combustible materials. For now though, the people who are affected by these fires are looking on helplessly as their goods continue to burn away. Reporting for Joy News from here at Makola, my name is Manuel Kranting. Meanwhile, the Ghana Union of Traders Association is demanding that the fire service presents all the reports from forensic fire audit conducted into market fires across the country. Dr. Joseph Obing is the national president of Guta. And that's why uh, it, uh, it, it is now becoming so worrying. And that's why we don't want the ad hoc solutions now. And that I'm calling for the various reports that have been um, gathered from the forensic auditings that we did in the uh, KJTR market uh, to Kanesi market and uh, Kantaman. You, 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 want, you want what exactly? We, we want the reports that have been gathered so that we can evaluate. A committee should be set so that we can prefer solutions to this permanently. Uh, because this shouldn't reoccur and it's getting so worrying and we keep on consuming the little capital that we have. Uh, I mean, we cannot uh, afford this thing. The, the fact that National Insurance Commission is not coming up with a, co a, a, a suitable program uh, of, uh, for insurance for the informal sector. And they are shying away from um, 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 insuring um, um, people in this area because of the risk factors, because of the congestion, uh, because of inaccessible to these places. So when the risk teams come, um, they normally put a high premium where the locals cannot afford. To develop in the Ghana National Fire Service says, contrary to claims out there, it is more than ever adequately resourced to fight all fire outbreaks in the country. Speaking at a news conference Tuesday, Chief Fire Officer Edwin Echo Blanksing raised concerns of the encroachment of its fire hydrants. He says the lack of access to a nearby source of water contributed to the intensity of the fire that engulfed the three-story building in the Central Business District on Monday. A lot of hydrants have been sealed. The one in front of Makola itself is sealed. The one at UTC, that one too is sealed. They were doing that during the beautification of Accra. And that was the situation. The UTC one is sealed. Ghana Supply Commission, the one in front, is sealed. So they have to go to circle, travel to Jubilee, uh, house for replenishing. Madam, assuming you are fighting fires and you go about four miles to replenish, would the fire wait for you on your return? 
it will we have traveled. It's normal. I know we have some equipment challenges, but the government is doing everything to fix it. Just this afternoon, I've discussed it with my admin and operators and the communication officer about the need to visit outside to make uh, pre-construction inspection of a package that we are taking from outside. That is allowable. People are saying that protective clothing. Yes, protective clothing. The government has supported the fire service more than ever. Hitherto, we were having clearance for 200, 300. Now we're taking them in thousands. Thousands. Two thousands. And they are coming. Some of them are in town now. It's not true that the government is not caring for the fire service. That is unheard of. It's not correct. And I remember very, very well done someone. A fire had done best in the bedroom of somebody. There. The bedroom, the bedroom got flooded. And he quickly ran out with the family and started to call the fire service. That is the abuse. That is the abuse. They are not sensitive. All who they say that fire will not come. Fire will not come. Then the abuse keeps on traveling. Fire will not come. On this part, Director of Operations of the Ghana National Fire Service, Owusu AJ, provided explanations why the flames continue burning even after 24 hours. Yes, we have made a collaboration with the private water tankers. It's, it's unfortunate uh, they failed us. But we have that um, coordination with Ghana Water Company. All the hydrants are under Ghana Water Company. They do the servicing, the installation, and everything. Then we use them. Um, we, it's unfortunate that it's the same drinking water that we're using to fight fire. So sometimes the pressure is low when water is being pumped to other sections of the country. And that's why we have problems where we have to travel that length to get water supply. Um, like yesterday, we had to go way back to the Jubilee House uh, to trade fair to collect water. And then looking at the distance, uh, the obstacles in terms of traffic jam and all that, you know, we had to take some time off for it to come back to fight the fire. And that's why it's escalated. And also, the combustible items in there were uh, really um, hazardous. We had certain things like alcohol, that is, um, we had um, permanent creams, cosmetics, we had um, polythene packed, and most of the stores were used as warehouses, so, so they were packed to capacity. And also the structural layout of the stores was such that um, they were partitioned with metals, with wood, and they had vents at the top. So when the fires got in there, they went through the vents, and it was quite difficult uh, to tackle. But um, with our expertise, we've been able um, to, um, uh, as, as I say, now we have just pockets that we are tackling with. Regional headquarters of the Ghana, uh, Greater Accra, we have installed a borehole. And uh, these are mechanical boreholes so that we have um, reservoirs. So they will always be um, readily available when the needs be. So we intend to replicate this all over the country. And um, we will also take the opportunity to ask for philanthropists and all concerned Ghanaians to help us um, make this dream come true. You're watching Joy News from We're Taking a River Still Ahead in the Bulletin. NDC youth successfully pull off March for Justice demonstration to, among others, protest brutalities meted out by security personnel. It was a call to action as leaders of the National Democratic Congress took turns listing why they believe supporters gathered in protest as well as all other Ghanaians should speak up. And then 14-year-old boys beat gets chopped off in a chainsaw accident. I'm we'll be back with this station.
Well, we shall fetch that story uh, for you uh, shortly. But in the meantime, the chiefs and people of mining communities in the western region are pushing for infrastructure development such as roads that will raise their status to that of Johannesburg in South Africa, which is also a mining city. To this end, a secretariat has been established to champion this agenda. There is more in this report. Joy Business understands that the mining firms will donate proceeds of their earnings into a fund that will be created to facilitate the project. Kwabna Ochre Dakumensa is the Western Regional Minister and was speaking at the launch of the Office for the Mining Sector Rehabilitation Secretariat. Western region is the number one contributor to Ghana's GDP. Western region is the number one contributor of gold production in Ghana. Is the number one contributor of manganese. Is the number one contributor of oil and gas. And then even when it comes to coconut, we do 85%. And then when it comes to rubber, we do 98%. So when somebody decides that they want to work hand in hand with government to be able to unleash the potential of upgrading our towns and cities in the mining enclave into first class, like what we have it in Johannesburg, Calgary, and the rest, we believe that such a person needs to be supported. And it's for that reason that we are here today to support him so that we'll be able to fix our infrastructure in the western region. The Jason Hine of Apinto Divisional Area in Takwa, Nana Adakwa Bidiaku said it's long overdue for the western region which houses chunk of the nation's natural resources to be developed to the highest standard. He's optimistic the Secretariat will fast track the infrastructure development. In 2017 we heard about the, a speech from the president at that time regarding the state of mining communities and the need to upgrade the state of mining communities and for for a while we've been expecting something like this to happen on my own behalf and from people from mining communities in the western region and beyond we think there's a great opportunity for us to develop the roads in our net in our communities it is our hope that the setting up of these projects and this secretariat will facilitate said development in our communities and allow the mining companies to contribute beyond their usual corporate social responsibilities to the development of our communities. We are hoping that this secretariat will facilitate the roads development network. The western region boasts of natural resources such as crude oil, gold, manganese, bauxite, and cocoa. And that'll be it for business for this segment. Sport is up next. Just stay. Real Smith here with the first batch of sports updates. And in our first story, a FIFA and CAF safety security officer, Nick Ousu, has advised the Ghana Football Association not to rely on the police service and other security agencies to fight hooliganism in their domestic football games. According to him, security at match venues is different from normal policing. Yes, you see, the, uh, the way, the way football, poli uh, football security is delivered is, is nowhere in the training manuals of the Ghana Police Service. So you cannot and you should not rely solely on the Ghana Police Service, as it were, even all other state security agencies, to be able to deliver that. There should be someone who is trained in, in working with these state agencies to ensure that these deliverables are achieved. So uh, that is why I, I am highly recommending that the GFA trains and appoints regional safety and security officers. So when a match is flagged in your region, you are mandated to work with the security agencies and deliver the match operationally. Because the, the operational competencies of the pe personnel who are assigned to these duties uh, in terms of running football security is, 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 not, is not as it should be. And okay. you cannot blame them because it's not part of their day-to-day of their day -day, uh, activities. Training. It's okay. not part of their day-to-day -day activities.
Black Stars keeper Andre Ayew has compared the leadership styles of the three captains he has played with so far. Steven Apia, John Mensah, and Asamu Ajan. Speaking on the Super Morning Show on Joy FM, Andre described Apia's leadership as top class, and John Mensah as one who doesn't speak much, and Jan as the jovial kind of leader. I think um, each one of them, they were all different. Mm. In their how was Steven Apia, for instance? How was John Mensah? How, how was Asamu Ajan? I think Steven was top class. Top class as a leader. I think uh, he's someone who had the charisma, who had the love from the Ghanaians. So, and on the pitch he was marvellous. Mm. But he had those two um, things on the side, which is the charisma, the love from the Ghanaians that gave him that power to be able to control everything that was happening in the squad. And he knew how to deal with players. He knew how to motivate players. Um, for me, he was he was top. He was a, a different... For me, as the first time coming to the Black Stars, he was the leader. Mm. And I was watching him a lot, spying him. And I really took a lot a, a lot from him because he he has that thing that thing he did not learn no one taught him it's some is a gift by 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 god yeah. that's why he was able to achieve all what he achieved with the with the black stars john mensa also was a different leader didn't speak much was always calm in his corner but he spoke on the pitch john mensa was the one his 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 performance on the pitch will make you understand what he's telling you. Mm -hmm. you. You understand? And that was um, his style. He wasn't a big talker, he wasn't a big... But he was always calm and he had the respect from everyone. But mainly because he used to perform on the pitch. When he wore the Black Star jersey, I don't remember one game where somebody can say John Mensah did not play well. I don't remember. I'm trying to recall. Since I was in the Black Stars, I don't recall, recall that then. Last it was baby, baby jet. Another style also, yeah. more jovial, more into you know the laughter side of ways with the players, the way to interact with his with 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 the squad. He had that ability to to be able to interact with any any player at any time due to the way he comported himself, which was different from the two two leaders two leaders before yeah. and we all know he's the all time Ghana goal scorer. Yeah. He woke up African top scorer. He, he's he, he, when we needed a goal baby was there to yeah. <laughs> to deliver. So you know like I explained these three so I try to take a little bit from each of them and add my own to try and do something Right. Andre said a lot. You can get all the other headlines on myjoyonline.com. In the Euros, it's halftime between Spain and Italy. Really good game. Very good game, but no goals. And currently, the highlights are that Emerson of Italy has hit the woodwork for Italy, um, has hit the woodwork for the Azzurri. Donnarumma has kept out almost drive. And so we are looking forward to the second half. Remember, the winner of this game will face... The winner of tomorrow's semi, that's England versus Denmark. And also don't forget, we are broadcasting the Euros from now until the final in 4K. And Joy Prime is the first station in Africa to do so in collaboration with HD Plus and Samsung. Later, we'll be hearing from George Addo Jr., who is in England at Wembley, and will be bringing us the details tomorrow. Right, let's get on with showbiz. Huh? Becky Bex is here. Hello, Becky. Hello Bex. to you, Easy. How you doing? I'm well. How about you? I'm fantastic. I'm not too fine because uh, today marks exactly seven years since uh, Castro and Janet's Bundy disappeared. disappeared. Yeah. And well, according to the state, uh, when you you get, when you're missing for all seven years, you you are declared dead. Yeah. So we're expecting apparently. A court is supposed to, you know, officially, you know, okay. declare. But well, obviously, because uh, today marks the seventh year, everybody it's you know writing an R.I.P. Yeah. and all of that. Well, even though there there are people who who believe that 
that kind of stress, you know, that and that he's somewhere, he's going to mm -hmm. yeah. appear sometime. Some, some of them are saying R.I.P. <laughs> oh, those people are also yeah, saying R.I.P. Yeah, of them okay. are saying R.I.P. So we put together this uh, report, everything Castro from 2014 till today. That's true. Are we supposed to say that? Yeah. I mean, for the people who he's are still gone. hoping that you'll come back. But he said those see. people are still writing. Well, right. that's just a few of them. Let's just wait for some time, maybe <laughs> next year. Uh, hopefully, he'll return right. or something. Yeah. Uh, let's move away from Castro. Let's talk about Akwaba. Akwaba said that, says uh, it took him uh, five to six years for, you know, the many Ghanaians or for fans to really appreciate his kind, kind of, of music. music. Yeah, he's been speaking to... Uh, my colleague Ibrahim Benbako. You know, it took me almost five, six years to really, for people to really get what I am doing, for people to really buy into it. You get my point? For the weddings and then corporate events, for people to say, I come, come and perform for us. So it's a gradual process, and eventually I know we will get there. What are you doing? What am I doing? As in, I mean, it is a gradual process for people to get what you're doing. Yeah. What are you doing? Okay, so um, I'm giving um, Ghanaians, all my fans, all around the world, something to um, think about almost every time. The moment you listen to a song from Akwaboa, you know you have to think deep. You know It has to affect you emotionally. Whether you, you have a broken heart, there's a song to fill you in. Once you're happy, there's a song to take you there. Once you want to think about life, there's a song out there. So what I'm doing is affecting people's lives with the songs that I'm doing. All right. Has this song affected you in any way? Well, I love, uh, he has a number of songs that I love. The one that he performed with the dad is yeah. uh, one of my, my favorites. Favorite. Okay. Yeah. He has impacted me. Like okay. The last songs. Oh, All right. I fell in love once. Yeah, because of the song. But it's not important, right? All right. My love life is not important. Let's Thank go. you very much, uh, Becky, for bringing us a uh, showbiz. We have more stories coming your way. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hundreds of NDC supporters poured out onto the streets of Accra Tuesday demanding immediate implementation of the Emil Short Commission of Enquiry Report, payment of compensation to victims of brutality meted out by security agencies, and investigations that will lead to the prosecution of culprits. The petition was presented to the presidency as part of a four-hour protest walk from the Accra Mall to Parliament with a brief stop at Jubilee House where the first petition was presented. The demonstration follows the killing of two protesters at a Jura in the Ashanti region, an incident that is currently being probed by a ministerial committee. There's more in this report. It was a call to action as leaders of the National Democratic Congress took turns listing why they believe supporters gathered in protest as well as all other Ghanaians should speak up. From economic hardships to police and military brutality, they called for change.
Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Samuel George, alleged a meeting had been held by government to unleash military personnel into the demonstration. We have an arrangement with the IGP of police on the route we are using. The rules of this country say that crowd control is the job of the police. In fact, part of this demonstration is because military men were using ground control and they shot and killed on Amgarians. Yet some people in government had a meeting last night and decided that despite the presence of the police, they intend to bring in the military to beat up our But as the walk began, it was obvious the police was in charge with a heavy presence as they marched alongside the protesters. From the Accra Mall, the thick crowd marched through the Opebia Junction, Defence Ministry, Land Commission and finally got to the Jubilee House, where a human wall had been formed by police officers with others seated on horses. The petition was presented, but first, the contents were read out loud by the National Youth Organiser, Giorgio Pariado. Petition to President Ekufuado by the National Youth Wing of the National Democratic Congress. The framers of the 1992 Constitution were spot on when they made provisions in Clause 1 of Article 1 that the sovereignty of Ghana resides in the people of Ghana, in whose name and for whose welfare the powers of government are to be exercised in the manner and within the limits laid down in this Constitution. In the strict adherence to the meaning of this provision, Your Excellency, we took the presidential oath on 7 January 2027, when you were first, 2017, when you were first elected president of the republic. Although our party, the NDC, contested the general elections, which were subsequently decided in your favor by the Supreme Court of our republic, we took the same oath on January 7, 2021, to serve another four-year term. The presidential oath, as we know it, was not and cannot be fanciful words set for purposes of formality. Despite the polarized nature of our country, Ghanaians who voted for you, and indeed those who voted for your opponents, succumbed to your constitutional arrangements and, and entrusted their will and aspirations in your hands. The hopes of every Ghanaian, including your political adversaries, was to see you uphold the tenets of our constitution, sustain the peace you inherited from your predecessor, improve upon the economic well-being of Ghanaians. Here is a response from the man who received the petition on behalf of President Akufado. He is Deputy Chief of Staff in charge of operations, Emmanuel Edumwa Bosman. It is indeed a right that you have exercised rightly and we also have to complement it in order to build the democracy that this country is noted for. It is not during the tenure of Nana Akufuado that will undermine the rights that have been guaranteed in the constitution and for this reason I have been asked to come and receive the petition so that what should be done officially shall be done for the benefit of all of us in this republic called Ghana. From the Jubilee House, the protesters continued the march to Parliament House. Here, it was a battle for the gate to be opened as the protesters pushed and shoved. It took the party's General Secretary, Johnson Asirun Ketia's call to order to gradually clear up the entrance. Finally, the second petition was handed over. It was received by both the majority and minority leaders. The Speaker of Parliament has had to respond to an invitation by his colleague in Nigeria. And that is why you are not seeing him here. The Speaker is not by any means avoiding the demonstrators. It's hard to respond to a call from his counterpart in Nigeria. That's why he's not here. There's a reason why the minority leader and I are here to receive your petition for and on behalf of the institution and indeed because it was addressed to the speaker we are receiving, we are receiving it for and on behalf of the speaker. Our assurance to you is that parliament will not fail the people of Ghana in demanding that right be done and right be done to safeguard the peace and stability of our country, right be done to safeguard the stability of our country, and right be done to safeguard our democracy. 
essentially the bestiality of unruly behavior of the security agencies is not acceptable anywhere. We will look into it, probe into it, where it requires that we read the security agencies of those uh, concerns raised. Parliament will not hesitate in doing that. I understand that the demonstration has generally been peaceful. That is how it should be. Freedom of expression is important and freedom to demonstrate is an important in a democracy for the expression of legitimate grievances. That was how the protest ended. But as people dispersed to their homes, they were reminded by the party chairman Samuel Ofosu Ampafo that this demonstration will not be the party's last until the issues raised have been, have been duly addressed key among which is ending police and military brutality and ensuring that culprits are not left off the hook. Gifty Andropia, Joy News, Accra. Now, Parliament has deferred to Wednesday a decision on what to do with the NDC's petition to the Speaker for leadership to deliver further on it. Majority Leader Sir Chairman Sabonsu and Minority Leader Amin Idrisu had proposed a petition be referred to the Defence and interior as well as constitutional and legal affairs committees for deliberation and report back to the house the first deputy speaker joseph Wusu says more deliberations need to be done first um may i suggest that we defer any referral today and discuss it at the leadership meeting tomorrow thoroughly before i make any pronouncement right thank you Mr. Chairman Subonsu defended the NDC supporters' right to demonstrate. Mr. Speaker, we must live up to these happenings. We must also admit that they are not happenings relating to today. They happened yesterday and they happened the day before yesterday. Whatever it is, it is not good enough. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy that today seeing this demonstration that the demonstration itself was peaceful and that the demonstrators were protected by the same police the same security agencies is commendable mr speaker and the demonstrators came to parliament to present their petition that it happened means that democracy is working in ghana mr speaker it doesn't mean that our democracy is perfect and we must correct the processes and procedures to ensure that we straighten up our living within the remit of democratic rule. The speaker, as I said, we received, the two of us received the petition on behalf of the speaker. And we want to believe that the necessary processes will be triggered to ensure appropriate inquiry and investigation into the circumstances of the matters that have been referred to by the um, petition. The speaker, I do not want us to be selective. If we are selective about these things, we cannot achieve the, the purpose of investigating to protect life. The speaker, I believe that Whatever has happened, if it happened yesterday, if it happened the day before yesterday, if the matter is referred to the appropriate parliamentary committee, they should be given the authority to inquire into these matters whenever they happened, so that we'll be able to straighten the course of our democracy. Harry Andrews on his part commended the protesters for what he described as a very peaceful demonstration that achieved the intended objective. I do not, Mr. Speaker, intend to prejudice any work that Parliament will do under your guidance. Suffice it to add that the demonstration, I understand, was very peaceful. It drew attention to growing hardship in the country, but with particular emphasis on infractions, infractions of excesses of men in uniform, the security agencies, the police, and the Ghana Armed Forces, engage in some unacceptable bestiality of unruly behavior. May I speak at this parliament, I believe, will hold the police and the Ghana Armed Forces accountable as is required of us. Parliament remains a guardian 
of the fundamental rights and freedoms of citizens. We have a duty to preserve and protect our constitution. We have a duty to safeguard our democracy. And we have a responsibility to ensure that Ghana remains a peaceful, stable country. We cannot achieve that if freedom of expression remains on attack, civil liberties are disrespected, and no punishment is met at all. Teachers of Achimoto School have been undergoing COVID-19 testing in the school's chapel today. The testing comes as the regional health director announced a compulsory testing regime for all teachers of the school. This, according to the health directorate, is part of efforts to contain the spread of the deadly Delta variant. Judith Obutuchando has more in the following report. COVID testing for teachers began at 10 a.m. today at Hashimoto School after the regional health director announced a compulsory testing regime for all teachers in a meeting held yesterday. We were not allowed entry into the premises. However, some parents who came around complained bitterly about not being allowed to access their wards. According to them, they have not been given any information of the state of affairs in the school and are not allowed to see their children or take them home. They refuse to be filmed but granted an interview. Actually, it's very scary. It's very, very scary because we all heard that Del the Delta variant is very, very sp uh, fast spreading and uh, it kills very fast. So we are expecting the school to reach out to parents to at least come and pick up their words, at least after the test and then it comes out they are negative, you can allow them to go, then you quarantine the rest. Mm -hmm. But you can't keep the kids in school. Parents are worried. We are seriously worried. We don't know what's really going on. So that means they've not, being, not, they've not given you any information about what is happening? We haven't been given any information. All the information we have is what we read in the news. For To get an official information from the school, no, we haven't received that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And are you allowed to see your kids no, at this point? No, we are not. If you're lucky and you have um, a teacher around who knows your ward, you can come, leave something with them for them to give it to the kid. But then we've not been able to see the kids, not even hear from them. My parents, we were hoping by now the school would have at least given us information, updates about the situation going on at the school. Because we are all worried. The only updates that we know is from what we hear on the news. We don't know how our, our wards are faring, we don't know the conditions they are in. And so we're hoping and we are pleading with the school to at least contact with the parents and give us an assurance that our wards are safe. Mm -hmm. And if they can um, dispatch those who haven't contracted the virus home, they should just release them to us. Okay, you'll we'll be very grateful. Some hawkers around the school also raised concerns about the constant contact with teachers and day students despite the outbreak. We are afraid we might get the virus because the school children buy from us. The nurses as well as patients in the hospital also eat here. So when they buy from us, we try our best to sanitize our hands so that we too can be safe. We are all scared because you know this pandemic has brought a lot of uh, almost everything to standstill. So I think uh, the most important is for the uh, prevention measures, the pro protocols to be observed, the washing of the hands, sanitizing, and then distancing. The regional health directorate, however, will by the end of this week begin testing in the various dormitories, prioritizing students with symptoms. Judith Aotritando, Joy News. Now, this story from the western region town of Asankra, Bremang, will give you chills. It might sound difficult to imagine, but a 14-year-old boy named Collins Ampong got his feet chopped off by a bench saw machine. The incident occurred when the boy and his brother were playing at a local sawmill machine shop. Eyewitnesses say the boy was seen sitting at the close to the cutting edge of the machine as his other brother unknowingly sparked the sharp blade a device that ripped off both foot instantly. 11 year started crying for help from residents close by. 
Upon hearing the cries of the boy, the owner of the machine, who was within the vicinity, rushed to meet the 14 year with both foot ripped off from the ankle level. <laughs> That is the machine I use for my work. I was working on some panels for a client's doors. I didn't even notice when the children came to play in the yard before I realized his feet had been cut off. He was immediately rushed to the St. Gregoire Catholic Hospital where he received treatment. <laughs> if there was any consolation in tears, that is what family members, neighbors, near and far have gathered here to do, as their hope of rejoining the feet as impossible, according to doctors. The feet are in our custody. We will bury them later. The family is calling for financial support to undergo surgery. Uncle of the class four people of Asenkra Bremen Catholic School, Asunaba Asen, described the incident as unfortunate and very disheartening considering the financial status of the family. It is terrible news that his legs are off. Even though he's alive, doctor says his leg cannot be rejoined. However, he has been referred to the St. Gregoire Hospital, but we cannot foot the bill. We need help. Joy News in Nathalia Kwansa, Western Region. We're taking a break. We'll bring you this more business news. Stay tuned. In business, the University of Ghana Business School is calling for a collaboration between academia and industry to bridge the gap within the green financing sector. Speaking at the Green Finance Champions event early today, the senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Albert Ahenkan, indicated that the lack of data is affecting climate and green financing in the country. Hence, the government must help to build capacity in the industry to attract more investors. A collaborative effort among the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, the Partnership for Action on Green Economy, and the Executive Development Unit of University of Ghana Business School seeks to publicize green business activities in Ghana. Senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Albert Ahenkan, called for a collaboration between academia and industry to bridge the gap within the green financing sector of the economy. So, so I, I think, like you said, data is very important, but lack of data can affect climate financing. But I'm saying that how do we generate data? And I'm saying that there's that interface between the academia, the industry, the government is broken over the years. And we need to bridge this. There's a lot of data sitting in the academia, and we need to tap into this data. So government should collaborate with the academia, the private sector should collaborate with the academia, and let's build capacity in climate finance. There is, there is some um, policy direction, but for me, nothing is not clear. Um, it's very important that, you see, if you want to scale up climate, change, um, climate financing, it's very important that evolve the uh, private sector, because they have the finance, also, Dean of the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Justice Baole, called for a sustainable funding scheme for businesses in the green economy space. So one of the critical challenges that small businesses, especially businesses that are into um, the green economy space, face is the complete lack of understanding about the job that they, or the businesses that they are in there. Uh, and the, the, the misunderstanding has to do with the fact that, look, these businesses are not businesses that have a quick turnover. 
it takes a long time for them to actually be able to realize anything. And many of them are actually social enterprises uh, who are not focusing on profit per se. Uh, but they still need funding to be able to survive. The activities have long gestation period, which means that if they get any funding, it must be funding that either do not come with any interest or even sometimes no repayment uh, so that they can invest in areas that do not have guaranteed profits almost immediately. For his part, Deputy Banking Supervisor at the Bank of Ghana, Stephen Amma, says the central bank is committed to providing a conducive environment and policy directions for businesses to thrive in the area of green economy. Okay, so for us as a central bank, of course, we see climate change as a big issue. Um, climate change presents a risk to all of us. And of course, um, where we sit, we see the implication um, is having on a system. And of course, financial institutions are all exposed to the macro environment. Then that calls for some policies to address these risks that present to financial institutions. So the bank, in collaboration with um, other stakeholders in the system, EPA to be specific, the Ghana Association of Bankers really came together, and that was since um, 2015, um, to see how best we can come up with some principles to address the environmental and social issues we have within our system. Nicholas Brown's report for Joy Business. Our micro, small and medium enterprises are being encouraged to explore the venture environmentally focused business opportunities. Players in the MSME sector believe that this burden area holds the key to solving many social problems as well as enhancing business sustainability. The United Nations Capital Development Fund, together with SNV and uh, the Green Project, is spearheading the initiative to support sub businesses. We have more in this report. that impedes the growth of startups, entrepreneurs and MSMEs have been access to credits and sustainability. Under the Green Project, United Nations Capital Development Fund, UNCDF, has partnered the SNV to support the incubation of new or early-stage green businesses. Angela Yaira Kwashi is technical advisor with the UNCDF. When it comes to uh, SMEs, one of the main issues is access to finance, how to build their, their small enterprises, how to scale it up, and access to finance being a major challenge. So access to finance under Resort 3 is where the, we give them the opportunity to get in touch with these uh, financial institutions, in micro, uh, micro institutions, micro financial institutions, when it comes to access to finance, so that they build some, a relationship with these beneficiaries. With support from the European Union, early stage businesses will benefit from incubation and other technical support systems. Ms. Kwashi says it is important to boost the sector's performance. The MMDs currently have uh, they have all selected their intervention projects, so they are ready to uh, you know start with the project itself. The funds have been released by the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralisation and Rural Development, who is the implementing partner or the anchor ministry of the Green Project. She said this at a week-long training of trainers program for SOF staff to train cash for work recipients to improve their employability skills. Shai Bufuseni is project coordinator for SOS Green Project. We are doing a training of trainers program for the SOS trainers on the Green Project. And the, the Green Project is, is targeting training for 4,000 cash for work beneficiaries. These beneficiaries will gain some short term or temporary jobs where they will be paid the daily minimum wage of 13 cities. The group for a week held an exhibition for green businesses in Kumasi meant to strengthen local ecosystems that support youth employment and the growth of SMEs. Genevieve Parkachum is incubation and acceleration lead at SNV Green Project. The project is being implemented in 10 districts in the Ashanti and Western regions. For, for you to actually participate with us, one of the things that you have to pay attention to as a business is to uh, make sure that you are adhering to standards. The four-year project is funded by the European Union Emergency Trust Fund for Africa and the Embassy of the Kingdom of Netherlands in Ghana, SNV and UNCDF. Mona Lisa Frempon reporting. 
and the chief executive officer of the Ghana Commodity Exchange says the birth of the organization has helped reduce post-harvest losses, improve the quality of crops, lower transaction costs, among others. Addressing the press on the progress of the exchange, Tushigoka Ivovi said the achievement is, is uh, as a result of initiatives like the warehouse receipt system and the contract signing system. There have been significant gains in the agric space in recent times since the implementation of the Ghana Commodity Exchange. This, according to Chief Executive Tuchi Goka Ivawi, is as a result of initiatives implemented by her outfit. When a commodity enters our warehouse, actually you're not going to lose any of it due to poor storage. There's a maximum 1.5% loss and that's just due to weight. We talk about order, standardization, trading within defined rules because we are a rules-based organization. So here, because we're a rules-based organization, every single um, commodity that is sold is done through a contract and it is enforceable. So there's no more um, defaults in that area. Transparency. So now we start to share price um, and product information. So at the end of every trading day, you will get a text message to say maize grade one was sold at this price. Mrs. Ivoi also said the Ghana Commodity Exchange charges a poultry 0.9% on the commodities traded on the platform. She says the exchange always puts the interests of the farmer first. Usually the farmers will put their stock at the community level warehouses and then when they're able to build up enough stock at farmer based organization level, they will then um, bring it to the Ghana Commodity Exchange warehouse. It's stored in the warehouse and when they then decide to sell and they get their um, money for their commodity, that's at that point that they pay the fees, the, the Ghana Commodity Exchange fees. So they don't have to pay any fees up front because we know that its um, liquidity is difficult for them. The trading fee is one, let's say 0.9% on the buy and the sell side. So in terms of fees that the commodity exchange um, makes from trades, it's actually relatively low, it's pretty low. Um, and the value that um, the, the sellers and the buyers are getting are much higher. The chief executive of the Ghana Commodity Exchange also indicated that the exchange is not responsible for setting the prices of commodities for trading. According to her, the market determines the prices of food items as the exchange gathers information from the open market daily. What we do every day, the exchange gathers the open market price information. So literally every key market we get early in the morning, we get the information from the market. If it's maize, this is the price that it's going for in the market. And we provide that information to all our members so they know at least what the going price is. Now, some of them, now that they know that actually my quality is higher, so instead of charging the market rate, I want to charge a bit more. There are buyers who come to us and say, we're looking for certain quality commodity in certain quantities. I will buy if I know I'm going to get this quality and consistency in terms of volumes. So the farmer can actually get, thank you, the farmer can actually get, um, you know, better pricing. I must say that exchange does not set prices. The market sets the prices. The Ghana Commodity Exchange was established in 2018 to provide a regulated market that links buyers and sellers of commodities to trade by rules whilst ensuring the market is transparent. And of course, I'll leave you with a summary of our international business news, after which sports comes up next with Gary Al Smith to stay.
In boxing, the Ghana Boxing Authority's presidential aspirant, Henry Manley Spain, has laid down his vision for boxing before delegates ahead of the July 22 elective congress. He's prioritized three things, including an academy to an earth more talent for the sport in the country. The uh, GBA uh, TV, number one. Um, the academy that I wanted to set up. Also, the, um, there are other things that we've actually put in place. And therefore, I feel when the time comes, no one is holding me back. It's an assurance, and I had always assured people I had never failed the assurances. I'm going to deliver. If not, you can hold me to it, especially you, the press guys. I'm also going to deal with the media a lot because you are going to be a mouthpiece. I am not going to leave you alone. I am going to hold you tight. I'm going to hold you responsible. What we will be going for, the number one issue that we will be going for or chasing is to have a secretariat or secretariat, you call it. And that secretariat have to be equally like the football one, whereby each and every department of ours will have their offices. So if anyone needs an assistant and needs to come and talk to me, fine, they can see me. The vice is going to be there. If the, if, if the issue is on their licenses, the person in charge of licenses is going to have his office. They can easily walk in there and have all these things done. I wanted to uh, plead with you, the media, to know that I'm going to be with you. And I'm really going to need your support. I need you. I need you. I need you. Now, hospitals in Ghana will no longer have to deal with non-functional surgical instruments as 30 Ghanaians undergo training in surgical instrument repair, a two-week course meant to provide the hospitals with skilled technicians who can repair and maintain surgical instruments was provided by Safe Surgery Initiative. Love FM's Chrissy Deborah has more on this report. It's estimated 143 million additional surgical procedures are needed in low- and middle-income countries to save lives and prevent disability. Safe Surgery Initiative is a non-profit organization that provides surgical instrument refurbishment, capacity building, and education to low- and middle-income countries. Executive Director of Safe Surgery Initiative, Keith Miles, says the technicians will benefit from a continuous online training to make them fully certified. This is just the first step in our training program. After that, they go through more online training. There's opportunities for remote training in other countries. And then we also do augmented reality training where they have online technical support from our um, local technicians based in the U.S. and, and other um, areas around the world. Once they've completed that certification uh, process, they get their certificate and they'll take an exam to qualify them for surgical instrument repair. So it's a, it's a, this is just the beginning step of a long process that we're going to walk each of our participants through from beginning to end with full support of Safe Surgery Initiative in collaboration with Smile Train. The participants were drawn from the Ashanti, Bono, Northern and Greater Accra regions. The training was sponsored by Smile International with support from Ghana Cleft Foundation and the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. President of the West African College of Surgeons and President of Ghana Cleft Foundation, Professor Peter Donko, says this comes as a relief to especially surgeons. He said the program will be expanded to accommodate technicians from other regions. I think I'm sure that again, the, the surgeons will be happy, that's first thing. If surgeons are happy, it means that the operations are going well. So the patients, you expect that operation time will be shorter because uh, you don't have to, what you should be able to cut very quickly. The instrument is no longer blunt, it's sharp. Uh, you not, no longer have to wait for what is not available. All the things that you, so yes, things are going to be much better. Quality of care is bound to improve. I've been primarily from the CEO of Confanoji Teaching Hospital, Dr. Hineba Usudanso, was optimistic the training was significantly less than the financial burden caused by equipment breakdown. 
Safe Surgery Initiative donated surgical tubes worth 50,000 US dollars to the Confanoche Teaching Hospital. Reporter for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. That's how we end the bulletin this evening. I'm Israel. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.